This week on The Communicators, a conversation with Representative Cliff Stearns, the ranking member of the House Telecommunications and the Internet Subcommittee. And the representative has uh, joined on the committee since uh, last year and joins us to talk about issues relating to telecommunications on The Communicators. Thanks for joining us, Representative Stearns. Pedro, I'm glad to be here, and thanks for the invitation. Representative Stearns, can you give us a little bit of history about how you ended up in the position of ranking member? For sure. I was uh, chairman of the Commerce, Consumer Protection, and Trade uh, in the last Congress when we were in the majority. And I've had uh, six years to do that position, and the six years under our rules, uh, you expire and then you move on up to the next committee. As it turned out, uh, Dennis Haster, the former speaker, was chairman of the Energy in, uh, Subcommittee, uh, he left, he retired, and then Fred Upton, who was the chairman of the Telecom Committee, of which I am now chair, uh, he moved to Energy and I took his slot. Uh, so it was pretty much a case where we all moved to the new positions after serving six years, which was logical, and I was very uh, pleased and gratified to be able to be the uh, new subcommittee ranking member now, since we're in the minority of the Telecommunications and Internet Subcommittee of Energy and Commerce. Uh, as the ranking member, what do you think as far as uh, your experiences in the past, not only congressionally, but your uh, work experiences as well, what do you think do you bring to the position of ranking member, particularly as it comes to telecommunications issues with particular of interest to the Internet? Well, Pedro, I'm glad you asked that question. Um, I'm an electrical engineer by training, uh, and I served in the Air Force as a captain. I was an aerospace engineer doing satellite reconnaissance. Uh, and looking at the uh, video, Viticons at which we put in the satellites and how the demodulation uh, came back to the ground and we read this out. So I have a lot of experience in the telecommunications industry. Uh, also I uh, work for a data control company, a computer company, uh, doing uh, design and manufacturing of demodulators for communication to satellites in Danbury, Connecticut. So I have some commercial experience, uh, work experience, uh, plus, I've served in Congress, this is my 20th year, and serving on the Commerce, Consumer Protection and Trade, the committee I chaired, uh, we had a lot of experience dealing with the Internet, uh, uh, particularly dealing with intellectual property rights, uh, also dealing with spyware that comes over the Internet, uh, dealing with privacy. I had about seven or eight hearings dealing with privacy on the Internet, uh, also dealing with data security, not just on the Internet, but uh, all these databases that uh, both... Uh, uh, the, the Visa and Master Charge and the credit card companies have and all this information they have about us in separate banks which they use to sell us and market us. So I think the experience I had uh, previously on the committee I chaired together with my background and the work experience I think makes me uniquely uh, suited to uh, provide uh, some leadership on this uh, new subcommittee. And so as ranking <clears throat> member uh, what do you see as priorities for you, as far as maybe individual priorities of thing you want to, things of and issues that you want to bring to the committee that you think are important to, to be discussed? Well, obviously the first one is a digital uh, transition. As you know, on February 17, 2009, all the analog televisions in America will go dead, and that spectrum will be sold off uh, to for third generation wireless, uh, and also a portion of it will be used for emergency responders. Uh, so we're going to have some unique additional capabilities for our cell phones and uh, also for emergency response uh, in the case of terrorist attacks. Uh, but this transition is extremely important and um, it's going very smoothly at this point. Um, there is a 1-888, uh, 1-888 uh, toll-free number, DTV2009, uh, and you can get all the information about this digital transition. Now this, uh, Pedro, is simply going to be that uh, if you do not have a cable or you don't have satellite television and you have an antenna, then you're going to need a little box. And the coupons will be provided to you from the government so that you can get two coupons and you can get two boxes to put on your analog television so you, you'll be able to get digital TV. So you ask one of the priorities I have, and I'm sure that Chairman Markey would share the same view, is to make sure that digital transition is successful uh, and that all of Americans can transition to this high definition uh, and digital age which we're moving to. So that's perhaps the first priority. Uh, the second uh, priority is um, dealing with these wireless uh, cell phones, uh, dealing with consumer protection in terms of all the different states now are passing laws 
to protect consumers under contracts that they got on cell phones. Uh, and all these different uh, states are creating uh, a morass of legal problems for the, the companies. So we're thinking about a federal bill that would preempt the states and set a federal guideline dealing with protection of consumers so that consumers would not have to uh, look at a myriad of uh, different regulations when state they move from state to state. And also the manufacturers would feel safe that when they get sued, they wouldn't be sued in 50 states for consumer complaints. So I think that's important, particularly in light of the fact we're going to third generation wireless with the sale of the analog uh, spectrum from uh, the TV. And of course the third generation wireless is going to uh, really increase productivity uh, together with increased broadband, increased um, high definition television. So I think in terms of my priorities, in terms of those three things, uh, Pedro, uh, third generation wireless, high definition television, and broadband. Uh, so uh, the third area is to make sure that uh, companies can lay down fiber optics across this country and provide services in a competitive manner so they can compete against cable, they can compete against uh, satellite um, broadcast, and so that the consumer in the end is very uh, able to choices and low price to have high speed broadband. And I don't mean what has been sold today is maybe something like uh, 600 kilobits per second, but up to four or five million uh, bits per second is eventually up to 10 million uh, bits per second. And so that would mean you could download a DVD in less than 15 seconds. So the productivity in America will increase dramatically uh, with the scenario of those three uh, objectives. So taking those as tent posts, so to speak, right. let's talk some issues regarding each of them. Okay. When, it, when it comes to the DTV transition, you said you wanted it to be a success. How would you gauge su success come February? Well, if there's no complaints, there's obviously going to be some complaints. Uh, there's 37 different kinds of boxes now. Um, and so, and I think we've, we've heard, uh, uh, I think four and a half million people have already got the coupon. Uh, you just call the uh, uh, toll-free number I gave. And this whole thing is handled out of the Commerce Department, uh, the National Telecommunication uh, Information Agency of the Commerce Department is providing the transition and the information and the coupons. Uh, right now, I think it's going very smoothly. Um, I've had town meetings, and the question I ask, uh, do all of you know that your television, uh, your analog TV will be shut off in 2009, February 17th? They all know. I said, how many people have coupons? They all raise their hand. Uh, do you understand that if you have cable or satellite, you don't have to need a box? So I think the information's out there, and of course the cable companies and the satellite companies are advertising regularly on their channels. So. Um, we have our fingers crossed. Uh, there are a few problems, uh, perhaps, uh, that people complain about. Maybe there's not batteries in the, in the boxes, so in the event that uh, you have a, a power failure or uh, sometimes people who have a low power broadcast, this gets a little technical, uh, they are not transitioning into the digital and they're going to have an analog signal. Uh, so they want that analog signal to still pass through their box. And right now some of the boxes don't allow that. That's sort of a technical, it's a very small percentage. But, you know, that's an example where we're going to work that through and, and hopefully we'll be very successful. When you say work it through, does that mean requiring the Commerce Department uh, to build in filters to make sure that those low power television signals are received? Or possibly to put in a splitter in the boxes so that the digital comes in and the analog comes in and maybe some box could be modified to handle those very low power uh, stations that are not going to uh, transition to high definition. Uh, and I think uh, we've had enough hearings on this to know that th that problem is very small uh, but it's still a potential problem because when you talk about low power you're talking about religious networks, you're talking about uh, um, Stations this, along the border and those kind of things as well, if I understand it correctly. Right, and you're also talking about uh, Latino uh, broadcast, Hispanic broadcast. Uh, you might be talking about some public uh, service, uh, local uh, broadcasts that people have uh, for um, uh, the local uh, county commission or city council. Uh, so some of those who do not uh, transition, most of them will transition as part of uh, a public radio or public television, rather. Uh, but uh, you know, I, I give you those potential two problems that mm -hmm. uh, we have to work through. Uh, another situation that's emerged, I guess, over the last course of this is that the person that had 
of the program at the uh, National Telecommunications and Information Administration, we're on our third person since the inception. Uh, most recently, Meredith Atwell Baker leaving and a new person coming in. Uh, does that rapid change in leadership concern you, especially so close to transition date? It does not, uh, Pedro, because we have in place the procedures. And I think the procedures uh, preempt the person because um, you know, industry is out there manufacturing the boxes to a specification, and we have the consumers aware. We have the broadcasting of the advertisements that are coming on the uh, cable and the satellite. So I don't think a change of personnel would be that uh, injurious to the transition. Uh, another situation over the last couple of weeks is that Chairman Martin, I guess, has floated a proposal as far as maybe test running some of the transition sites in the United States instead of a full blanket rollout in February. What do you think about that procedure and does it add any benefit to making sure that people are uh, well prepared come February? I think it's a good idea myself. Um, whenever industry starts a new idea, whether it's a restaurant they own or a hotel or it's marketing a new type of manufactured product, they do a test market first to see if there's any problems. And I think uh, Chairman Martin is wise to do that, to set up a demonstration uh, and to roll it out in a transitional period so that you can uh, take all the glitches and stop them so that when you go across the United States, you don't have these glitches. I, I think it's a good idea. As a person who is uh, from the state of Florida with a large elderly community, are you hearing from folks concerning uh, the transition, especially that they understand all the nuances involved in it? I am. Uh, in the rural part of my congressional district, which runs from Jacksonville in the north down to just above Orlando, I have north central Florida, uh, through the University of Florida, uh, most of the people in the communities, the seniors only community, have cable. And so it's not a big problem. They will not, uh, the cable will take care of everything for them. But for those people that are out in the farming community, in Gilchrist and Levy, where there's a lot of farming and they're using an antenna, those are the people I worry about. And that's why I have on my website uh, where you can go to uh, get the coupon. I, I, all my town meeting notices and everywhere I go, I talk about the digital transition so that those folks will not be in the dark. Uh, turning to, to wireless issues, uh, recently the chairman, uh, Ed Markey, introduced a, a draft statement, I, I believe, concerning a potential regulation when it comes to wireless issues. Could you give us the, you, you briefed on it, but could you give us what that bill would do should it pass? Yeah, uh, Pedro, I'll, I'll be glad to. Um, in many states now, um, there is very little consumer information when you purchase a cell phone. Uh, many people, particularly young, will realize they'll sign a contract for two years and the cell phone is practically free. Then if hap perhaps they see a new cell phone and they want to get out of the contract, there's a heavy, heavy, heavy uh, penalty that they have to pay. Uh, so that upsets them. And they say, well, I didn't know about that. Well, some of the fine print. But then sometimes the cell phone they get is lost and they have to pay this huge fee to get it again when they thought that part of the contract is they get a replacement. So I'm giving you some of the nuances of these contracts. So each state now is trying to say we're going to protect our consumers by putting together consumer protection legislation uh, and put that onus on the phone company when they sell the cell phone to comply. So if you have 50 states doing that, you can be sure that Verizon, um, T-Mobile, uh, Singular, uh, all these companies are going to say, and there are many, many, there's almost 600 uh, companies that are selling and manufacturing uh, different cell phones. You can imagine that if 50 states start to have 50 separate consumer uh, pieces of legislation, uh, and, and then each one of these phone companies and phone manufacturers of cell phones could be sued in 50 different states, it's going to be a morass for everybody. So uh, Markey's trying to say, why don't we have a federal preemption, a, a standard consumer protection information? And we do this in lots of other industries, not just the cell phone. And uh, that way, the consumer will know what he gets from state to state, uh, whether he's out of Florida, whether he's in New York City or Vermont or California. And then secondly, the manufacturers and the cell companies, uh, when they're sued, they'll be sued in federal court, and they won't be sued in 50 separate uh, state courts by 50 separate state attorney generals. What's been the reaction from attorney generals, and specifically, what's been the reaction from public utility commissioners? Because clearly, they, I think, would want to hold on to the ability to... to not so much regulate, but at least look over this market for their consumers in their state. 
Pedro, you're right. Uh, a lot of these uh, commissioners uh, do not want to give up their responsibility, and they feel their uh, duty to, to, to oversee this. Uh, but uh, like so many cases, uh, even going back to the argument uh, whether we should have a, a federal constitution or not, uh, this becomes, I think, in the end, uh, a way for the states to get a standard which we will make universal across all 50 states and make it easier ultimately for the consumers because then they'll know whether they buy a phone in Connecticut or buy a phone in North Carolina that the uh, same consumer information will apply. Uh, it, it say, for, uh, for instance, a lot of uh, uh, cell phone companies now are adopting the way they, uh, they practice business, a flat fee for certain minutes per month, and this comes recently, I think, in threat of re uh, regulation, but why not perhaps give the industry a chance to, to make a, a resolve of these issues on their own? Well, I think that's what the industry would prefer, Pedro. I think they would, and I think, you know, I'd be glad to see it uh, go a little longer because I, if the industry can do it without a federal mandate, that would be just as well for me. Um, I think Chairman Markey feels differently, and I think that's why his bill is pretty much the early stages of saying, okay, let's see what we can do and let's get a comment period here and perhaps uh, we might not need a bill, but I think the hearing we had showed that uh, he's leaning towards a definitized uh, piece of legislation. And you would support it, should it become a bill? Well, I would support it only when there's certain conditions, Pedro. One of them is that there is a federal preemption so that you don't, you're not sued in 50 states. Uh, lots of times the Democrats um, are much more prone to allow the state attorney generals to go into state courts and sue. Uh, I would not support the bill unless there was that federal preemption so that the state attorney general could not do that. That would be one of the prerequisites for, I think, support of the Republicans on the telecommunications subcommittee. Uh, perhaps another is that the standard is uh, not overly uh, restrictive and prohibited so that um, you can't really have apt some type of negotiation. I want to have the choices for the consumer so that he, if a person is a young person and he wants to just have a cell phone for three months, he or she can do that. And if a person is maybe more uh, seasonal and in a career, that person can have a cell phone for maybe two years. And the benefit would be on the cost of the long distance, the cost of the local service, the unlimited uh, use of it, and the cost for the uh, cell phone itself. So all those things, I want to make sure uh, the choice for the consumer is not denied. This is more speculative in nature, but when we reconsider the Telecommunications Act in the future, do you think that drastic changes are going to be made as people move to their cell phones being the main line of uh, use rather than a landline phone? I think that's happening already. I talk to lots of people that move into their apartment or home and they just have a cell phone. Uh, they don't have a land lease line because they're negotiating these contracts and it, it works out pretty good. Uh, also, voice over the internet is coming so that you'll be able to get your uh, long distance and local right through the internet. In fact, uh, many people are doing that today. Uh, and so I suspect that is going to be um, a very competitive thing for uh, the uh, cell phone companies uh, as well as the cable companies and well as the phone companies who have the local lines in your home, uh, the local Verizon that gives you the phone and the AT&T. Um, so voice over Internet is going to really uh, uh, change that dramatically. Representative Cliff, Cliff Stearns, our guest on uh, the communicators this week. Representative Stearns, you weren't ranking member at the time, but at the end of last year, uh, Representative Dingell launched an investigation into the workings of the Federal Communications Commission. Um, could you give us a brief explanation of what he was looking for and what the status of that investigation is? Yes. Uh, Mr. Dingell has written a letter together with uh, Bart Stupak, who chairs the Oversight Committee, um, and um, John Shimkus is a ranking member. Uh, they want to do a hearing and bring in the commissioners, including obviously uh, the chairman, Mr. Martin, and ask him about transparency. I think that's the key that uh, Mr. Uh, Dingell is concerned about. And what I think he alludes to is the fact that the chairman with the commissioners uh, will have a comment period on a piece of legislation, uh, on a piece of action that they're going to prescribe for the industry. But the problem is that some of the industry says that the draft of it is not really made but what is provided is the thought process and what they want to do, but the details of the draft are never made in time. And I think some of the industry 
Uh, Mr. Dingo wants to see that is part of the comment period. And you and, mean by the industry, uh, who do you mean, sir? Well, if it's in case of broadcasters, uh, or if it's in case of um, the phone companies or the cable companies, any decision that the FCC would make, uh, they would like to see a copy of the draft language. Uh, there has been sort of a tendency, the perception is anyway, that when the, uh, the thought that we're going to do something, we want your comment period, like you would say, we intend to issue um, some kind of uh, spectrum uh, control on cable, and we'd like your comments how you feel about it. Well, the cable company would like to say, well, what specifically are you talking about? What is the, what is the draft language? And Mr. Chairman, we'd like to see the draft language. And sometimes he can't give that draft language because he doesn't know what the draft language would be because he wants to get the comments first because he, is, it the, is it the chicken before the egg or the egg before the chicken? So he's involved with a, sort of a catch-22 if he lets out exactly how he feels then he could not get uh, an objective uh, position. If he doesn't let it out, then the people can't know. So somewhere in that dialogue is what I think uh, Chairman Dingle is concerned about. Um, you know, I've asked uh, Mr. Markey, uh, who chairs our subcommittee, as well as Mr. Dingle, if my committee that I serve, uh, telecommunication, could meet with the oversight when we do this, uh, because technically the oversight committee can just investigate. They can't legislate. And we on the subcommittee on telecommunication can legislate, and so I'd like to be up to speed on whatever occurs during this hearing. And what do you think that uh, that participation will help you as far as the legislative aspect? And would this specifically apply to the FCC, or is this more for gaining knowledge about the workings of the investigation itself? I think it's understanding how the FCC works. I think that's good. And then ultimately, I think uh, both the consumer and industry benefits if there's a transparency. But at the same time, there's confidentiality. So I think that uh, dual balance is what we're looking for. Uh, I frankly don't think we need to have an oversight of the FCC. I support Chairman Martin. I think he's doing a very good job. Uh, there's some issues that uh, I might not agree with him, but heavens knows that uh, in any position of that magnitude, of that responsibility, in a nation this big, uh, the largest economic power in the world. Uh, we're the leading edge of this information age with not only uh, our computers and our broadband as well as our cell phones, but uh, a high definition. And so I can understand with all the competing interests that he has that he sometimes will make decisions that w people won't agree with, and I certainly don't agree with uh, some, some of his issues too. Uh, such as? Well, um, you know, there's some in an area of cable, for example. Uh, he would like to have a a la carte for cable. Uh, this means that the consumer, and it sounds good, that the consumer could say, okay, I want ESPN, but I don't want XYZ. Uh, and a person, a uh, family might say, I want to have Disney World, but I don't want to have XYZ. Uh, other person might say, um, I want all the major networks and I want my local, but I don't want all these other stuff. Well, the problem is that the cable uh, develops a package, and you can have that package, but if you take uh, that package, and you take things out of it, then it gets very expensive. And at the same time, the consumer won't pay for it, and it'll break down. So sometimes you have to put a package together which has all the things you want, and at the same time get a fair price for it. And I think Chairman Martin believes in a la carte, and he's pushed that. And so I think that's perhaps one area we should have a hearing on, if not um, try to understand it better so that the consumer uh, understands it better. because. You know, the consumer now has taken this uh, idea of a television and thinks it's a constitutional right and they should get ESPN. And uh, as you know, there's a controversy with the broadcasters of uh, the NFL now. Mm -hmm. They want to have their own broadcasting network. Uh, they, don't, they don't want to broadcast all their games on ESPN now. So if you get ESPN, you're not going to get all the games because you're going to have to get the NFL network. So that becomes an area also that I think Martin's got to uh, make some decisions on, and we've had a hearing on it. And that gets controversial because most of the consumers in my congressional district want to see the Patriots versus the Giants, and they <laughs> want to make sure they see the game. And uh, if they don't have ESPN, if they have ESPN and they don't get their local game or their other games that – well, for example, if you come from the north and live in Florida, you want to see some of the Giants game. You want to see the Patriots. But if you live in Jacksonville, you'll see the Jaguars, but you might not see these others under this new uh, broadcasting arrangement with the NFL. So that's another example of, of things that uh, can go awry. One other quick one. On February 13th, Chairman Martin uh, was before the committee. 
he read into the record or wanted a chart put it into record talking about cable prices saying that when cable was uh, I think in its advent 10 years ago it was $22 a month it went up to 50 bucks a month that prompted a letter from the National Cable Telecommunications Association to you and the chairman and part of what Kyle McSlarrow said in the letter was so he said that FCC chairman Martin sought to justify his efforts to impose numerous new Burdison regulations on cable industry by claiming cable prices have risen nearly by 100 percent over the last 10 years by omitting important information the continued use of this data paints a picture that's both deceptive and false could you get your thoughts on that sir well Pedro I'm impressed that you got that letter I'm impressed that you know uh, all about that hearing so you're staying pretty uh, on top of the situation uh, yes uh, he did put that uh, his statement in and, and indicated that cable was too expensive uh, was more expensive than uh, he thought uh, considering inflation but I think what happens is the cable people as they aptly pointed out is back when he was talking about twenty dollars a month you were getting thirteen channels today you're paying forty five dollars a month and you're getting seventy five channels uh, so the gist of the cable argument was you're getting more for your money today uh, then you got back when it was twenty dollars so the consumer can go back to a basic rate of, of twenty dollars but he's only going to get uh, ten or twelve channels so I think uh, Chairman Martin was not perhaps being fair to the cable companies because uh, they are providing a prodigious uh, selection to, uh, than they did uh, 15, 20 years ago. You talked about telecoms entering video uh, services and, and essentially, I, if, I, if I heard it correctly, I guess making it more efficient for, the, get to, for them to get into the game. What do you hope and what's your role in that, do you see, as far as a, a legislative role is concerned? Well, uh, one of the key aspects about this, this is a little technical, and, and uh, I don't want to bore the listeners, uh, but when Verizon uh, provides uh, fiber optics to my home, and they provide not just data and the Internet, but they provide through the Internet video, and this could be broadcast. Well, um, as it turns out, um, phone companies have to comply with a lot of FCC regulation now, and the cable doesn't. So what the phone companies want to say is if we are providing video through fiber optics and through the internet uh, we don't want to have to provide all the universal service and all the other regulations all the taxes because we can't compete with cable this cable at this point is a, a service that's not uh, regulated as a phone company so we want to compete with cable and we don't want to still be our phone company and have that uh, uniform imprint on us so the argument is going to be what should we as a legislators do to allow competition for cable with uh, the Verizons and the other people that are doing the huge amount of capital investment to put this uh, broadband in so that we can get uh, huge increases in speeds and ultimately high definition in our in our internet as well as ultimately a three-dimensional television which is, is coming down the pipe so you can see that there's going to be a clash of the titans between the cable industry the satellite industry and the phone companies once they start broadcasting video uh, through fiber optics and giving television if i'm correct don't uh, telecom companies get a chance to approach the states directly in order to gain access to those states they do but the problem is that sometimes they have to go to every small city in the state of florida and so they would like to go to one um, area of the state and have it approved so they don't have to spend all the money and go through all the the fractional inner politics of each city uh, like the cable does and the cable resents that because they've already established a franchise for example in my hometown of Ocala and so Verizon wants to go just and get a franchise for the state of Florida whereas they don't want to and that allows them to go to Jacksonville Ocala and Gainesville rather than have to go to each negotiated uh, city council to do it and so uh, we have to work that out, and I think it's going to have to be done on the federal level. Otherwise, uh, we won't see the competition. Aside from everything you talked about, we're almost out of time. What do you see as far as the agenda for the rest of the session? Well, I've touched upon the digital transition. As one other thing is net neutrality. Uh, Chairman uh, Markey dropped a bill, uh, which basically means that if a company wants to, like Google, uh, wants to approach the cable company and they want to put Google uh, through cable, which would include television as well as internet service, they're afraid that the uh, uh, Comcast or Cox uh, cable will say, oh no, we're not going to take you, and that would mean that uh, 
it would not be net neutral. And uh, Google and Microsoft and all these uh, want to make sure, eBay want to make sure they can get through the cable. So uh, Markey, Chairman Markey dropped the bill and uh, we'll have a hearing on it. Uh, uh, there's non-discrimination clauses, uh, which would mean fines and uh, penalties in his bill. Uh, but uh, I think that's an area that is perhaps a little overblown. Uh, I think the market can work itself through. Uh, obviously, on our cell phone today, we don't have net neutrality language, and we get everything we need on the phone. The iPhone now is uh, providing spectacular um, uh, choices for the consumer, so uh, I'm not sure the net neutrality is a good idea uh, or is necessary, but certainly uh, Chairman Markey, who is the uh, leader of our uh, subcommittee, has every right to uh, have hearings and discuss it. We've been hearing from Representative Cliff Stearns. He is the ranking member of the Telecommunications and the Internet Subcommittee and also serves for the state of Florida. Representative Stearns, thanks you for being on the communicators. Thank you, Pedro.